Great. Well, hello, everyone, again. So there's uh, a, a wonderful number of people and we can actually have hopefully a discussion, but it'll all have to be on the chat. But uh, we'll, we'll live with that and, and do the best we can with it. So we perceive the world around us through our senses. We see, we hear things. And these observations become cognitive knowledge once we process them and think about them. And they become cognitive in, in, our, in, our, in our heads, in our brains, in our minds. Now, recent psychology has shown that the actual barriers between perception and cognition are very, very blurry. People used to think they are quite separate, but they're not. Um, and there's room, therefore, for misinterpretation of what you're looking at at every step. So we're going to be discussing that today. I'm Sal Sankuri, and I'll be discussing these aspects of data visualization with you today. First, a little bit about how this is going to work. So. I had been hoping that this would be a more interactive workshop, but Hopin doesn't really quite work that way, although it is fabulous for different things. Um, and so I can't see you. I can see how many people have joined and I can see the chat. So, um, but I can't see who you actually are. I can't see any faces, et cetera. And if we are to have a chat, it only allows something like nine people maximum. I'm sure they're working hard at making it Zoom-like, but it's not quite there yet with that. So I can't see you. It's going to be more of a webinar. The only way to interact is through the chat. But that's cool because I will be there'll be some points where I'll be talking a bit and then showing you uh, something that I'd like your feedback on. Um, if yeah, we have been spoiled by Zoom. Um, if you could please uh, write in the chat, uh, this is what you think or here is your response to what I've asked or something like that. Also, please feel free to ask questions in the chat. I'll see them coming in. I'll probably answer most of them as we go along. But if I find that there are some very open questions that are discussion worthy, I'll keep them till the end if that's OK. So um, with that, let me make sure that I still know what I'm doing. Yep, here we go. Keep calm and visualize data. That's one of my favorite things. I began with keep calm and analyze data. And then I became visualized data and now I'm use data, but it doesn't matter really, as long as we're all keeping calm. <laughs> what I'm hoping that you'll walk away with today is um, a little bit about what is data visualization really? What do we mean by data? What do we mean by visualization and, and how, how that works? How you interpret the data viz that you're looking at? Um, and so I don't produce data viz anymore. Um, I'm very much, I've, well, I suppose I've always been an enabler of data viz. I do a little bit of data viz, but not really much. And I think it's our responsibility as producers, users, enablers of data viz to actually do it responsibly. So that's basically what I'm going to be talking about during this session. Um, I won't be doing this in a linear fashion. You will kind of absorb by osmosis as we go along. I think it's more fun that way. But anyway, again, please ask questions and I'll get to them as we go. Um, so then, here we go. Um, the perception and cognition with data visualization is something that has fascinated me for a very long time. So take the image here, for example. You see three bars and the three bars taken on their own show growth. It's a straight line going upwards. This is what you might show your voters, for example, if you're running for elections, or your shareholders if you're in a business and so on. But look at the orange line. That orange line tells a story of ups and downs, reassessments, new strategies. That orange line is the line of resilience, actually. It's showing that you are resilient and that you can re-strategize and continue to grow. So in fact, perhaps that orange line is the one that your shareholders would like to see rather than just a straightforward growth all the time. It's, it's a more of a nuance, it's a nicer picture. So what you perceive is what you see, what you hear, new information that you take in. How you understand what you perceive is your cognition. It is about matching the new information to pre-existing knowledge that you already have. So here I've used a very simple pie chart, basically. Very simple diagram. I could have used a jigsaw puzzle just as easily. Now, if your existing knowledge is already biased towards something, whether consciously or unconsciously, then your cognition of that new information is bound to be colored by it. So here I have used words such as color and bias. And whereas 
earlier you were just thinking perception cognition how fun now I've talked about bias and color I've created a whole realm of thought processes in your head so we all know the power of the words we use and this is about the power of the images we see a picture speaks a thousand words and and this is really what what that's all about the way it works is this we have our visual cortex at the back of the brain I mean, we all know that our mothers had eyes at the back of the head and so on, but that is actually, we see things through our eyes and they're processed at the back of the brain and the visual cortex. Our cognition is in the it's kind of frontal cerebral cortex thing, which is sort of on the front kind of. And this is slower than the visual perception. So the visual cortex is rapid, really fast. The speed between what we see and our knowledge that we've seen something is, is extremely fast, but our cognition of it, our understanding about what we've seen is a lot, lot slower. So David Kahneman and people have talked about system one and system two thinking, this is what it is. System one is rapid, quick, intuitive almost, and the other one takes a little bit longer. So data visualizations, any image really, makes the process of understanding data simpler by giving our brains a little visual help to try and think about the data more quickly, a little bit more deeply perhaps as well. Things like bar charts and pie charts are simple, easy, intuitive. We're used to them. We know what they say, okay? Here are some examples. Here's a bar chart, a pie in the middle, and a line showing trends at the, on the right. We can all see how well this company is doing, right? Record sales and all of it using fancy visualizations, right? But what scale did this person use for the bars on the left? And take a closer look at that pie in the middle. It might be evenly sliced, a little bit more than they like us to think. And then that thing at the end there with, with the soaring line, hmm, see how this... Already we're looking at it and already we're looking at sword, shares of company market, record sales. But let's explore this data a little bit more deeply. Let's, let's look at it a little bit more closely. So this is what it looks like when you actually use sensible scales and a sensible visualization to look at your data. What you find is that this company is doing worse than its main competitor in terms of dollar sales. It does not have a major market slice of the, of the market share pie. And while its sales since 2011 have not exactly soared at all. And so this is how perception and cognition can be manipulated by bad, bad data visualization or manipulative data visualization, at least. Remember these lines? I'm sure we've all seen them. We've all played games with these types of things, right? Which one is the longest? Do you want to write in the chat? Oh my gosh, I've got 33 people listening to me. I hope you're all enjoying this so far. Um, could you please write in the chat if you know about this already? Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. So a lot of people, the middle, Tom says, yep, yeah, okay. Katya says they're the same. The middle one is obviously the longest, says Jim, okay. Yeah, no, the same. Okay, brilliant. Well, so I'm going to spoil it a little for you guys here, and I'm going to tell you the real story. This is a very famous optical illusion. And these lines are actually exactly the same length, okay? They are probably all the same length. Yes, sorry, Jim. <laughs> they are the same length. This is, this, is a date, this is an optical illusion that is used quite a lot in explaining about data visualizations and how, yeah, absolutely, I know, Tom, it, it fooled me too the first time I saw it. Um, and so this is exactly what we talk about when we talk about manipulative data visualization. You can use optical illusion to play games with your perception and your cognition, a little bit like those colored and biased words I used earlier on. And tricks with data visualizations use a lot of these things. Um, so here's another one, see? Now, again, what you, if you look carefully at, at the triangles and circles on, on the right, you'll see that the white triangle isn't actually drawn per se, okay? There's, there's kind of Pac-Man circles and there's like, you know, bits of triangles, but the white triangle in the middle, there's no drawing of it. You just perceive it because of the way the other things are arranged. Again, this is another optical illusion. Okay, and again, data visualization type uh, of, of uh, techniques use these kinds of things quite a bit. So 
We've talked about data, we've shown optical illusions, we've talked about perception and cognition. I'd like to take a step back and actually talk about data. Not for long. I know, I know, I know this is about visualization. We're not doing data analysis here, but I really think it's important to just take a step back and think a little bit about data. Okay. So you can think of data points as measurements, evidence, things you can tangibly assess, number of books on a shelf, the number of words in the book, for example, the kind of text in these books, and so on. You look at um, the graphs, these graphs in the middle of the picture there, they show uh, prices of stocks being traded. The Excel spreadsheet at the bottom are amounts of certain substances in a cell, in a, in a biology genomics lab. And these are measurements, okay? They are hard evidence. There's no denying that. These are actual data points taken with care and scientific precision. But choosing your data source is where it all begins. Where you choose which library you go to count the number of books or to look at the text within those books, okay? Which population you choose to send your surveys to, you're already introducing some level of limitation when you choose your data sources right there. And the bias continues in terms of how you collect your data, what questions you ask in your surveys, what kind of text are you looking at? What, which types of books are you, are you counting? All books? Do you count pamphlets? Do you count monographs or just nonfiction or fiction? So at every step of choosing our data source, collecting our data, we are already choosing those assumptions and limitations and, and putting, it, putting it into a box already of our sample of data that we're looking at. This is an example of how not to do a data visualization. Your perception needs sunglasses, okay? And your cognition just wants to scroll on over something a little bit easier to interpret. Now, I lived in the US for 16 years. I love everybody in it. I've got lovely friends from Alabama. Please don't take this the wrong way. But this is a chart from Alabama Public Health trying to show the, COVID, the people who have been uh, affected with COVID. But there's a lot wrong with this data viz. As a data visualization, there's a lot wrong with it. First, I don't think a pie chart is the best way to present this particular data. The colors are a nightmare, okay? There are too many segments to really understand what is going on. And then where did this data come from? This is the result of the June 24th Alabama fact sheet. It is supposed to be based on counts, actual number of people in the hospital with COVID, for example, okay? But Look at race and look at ethnicity. Black, white, and Hispanic. Is a pie chart ever a good data viz? Yeah, I kind of agree with you there. Absolutely. Um, sometimes it is. This definitely isn't. Um, and there's a lot wrong with how they've spaced out the data. There's a lot wrong with how they've used the same color, let's say, for example, green, to denote unknown and 65 years and many other things as well. Unknown is green in one chart and purple in another and something else in another. So it's extremely confusing. You have to work really hard to understand this data viz. And then when you think about how they've grouped race and ethnicity, is it, any, is it actually informative at all? Does this actually tell us anything useful and meaningful? So this is data collection. This is data grouping already there. Cleaning the data is an important and necessary step because raw field data of every description is dirty. There's always missing values and so on and so forth, right? So when you say, let me do a first quick pass, let me just have a quick look to see where are my outliers? How can I clean up this data? Outliers brings up another thing I'd like to just spend a few seconds talking about. These are a couple of examples of outliers. These graphs come from an educational resource explaining what outliers are. So there's no labels on the axes at all, etc. Okay, that's fine. This is a made up data set. But they are clear, unambiguous charts. They're good data visualizations that tell a really good story. You can see where the outliers are, sort of. Um, and you can see where the maybe outliers are in that the, the question marks uh, in that uh, on the scatter plot. Um, so what do you do with outliers? By choosing not to take an outlier, you are already interpreting your data in some respects, right? You're already slightly cha changing or 
streamlining the story that the data is trying to tell you. You're already started interpreting it. Back when I was a research scientist, I made thousands of graphs like these, okay? What did I do with the outliers? I thought about them very carefully. Often I'd had to delete them, but I thought about them very carefully. And sometimes even the ones I deleted, I came back to later on and kind of really dug in to see whether they were actually the story I was looking for rather than that big, wonderful trend in the middle there. Very important to take a minute to think about your outliers. So that's with data um, collection and data cleanup um, and handling the data, and then you come to data analysis. And here, well, which model you choose to analyze the data and the thresholds you impose on your analysis, well, that could be the subject of another whole long discussion. That's a whole other thing. There is almost an infinite number of algorithms, an infinite number of models that you can use to analyze your data, to make it interpretable, to make it information rather than just strings of numbers and letters. Data analyst analysts are designing new algorithms by the second because every data set, every situation needs a little bit more thought, a little bit more nuance to it. If I was to talk about an example of a bad algorithm, I'd talk about the A-level fiasco a few weeks ago. My daughter was caught up in it, but let's not, let's not go there. Um, this graph is quite famous. It shows about what happens when you analyze rubbish data with an excellent model and you end up with rubbish, re <laughs> rubbish results. That's probably what happened with A-levels. Or you can have an excellent data with a rubbish model, and that could also end up with rubbish results. That's what happened with A-levels. Um, of course, you can have excellent data and just the right, correct type of model, an honest algorithm that gives you exactly what the data is trying to tell you. And then you end up with, with happiness all around. The thing is, really, that data doesn't lie. And once collected, and as you are analyzing it, and at every step, it's telling you a story. It's trying to tell you a story. We hear about data-driven. Data-driven is the data talking to you. And you have to be open to listen to it, and you have to be responsible enough to portray it as it is. So that's, that's all about. I really wanted to say about working with data, the models, the algorithms that lead you towards your data visualization story. Now let's look at this. This is a data viz of global happiness, according to a deep data dive presented at the International Visual Informatics Conference a few years ago. What do you see? Please use the chat here and tell me. Tell me what you see. Tell me your first impressions. Obviously, it's a world map, okay? Obviously, there's a scale on top. It goes from unhappiness in red to dark blue. That is happy. Look at this, the spacing of, of what they've done. Look at the iciness. Wealth equals happiness. Yes, that's definitely one thing that your cognition recognizes in this. What else? Tell me what you think about the data viz. Tell me what you think about the choice of color. What defines happy? Yes, absolutely. They had, they had algorithms and models to define happy. What was measured? Yes. Tell me about the data viz itself, the colors that they chose. The further one moves from start to finish, the more likely it is to show reality. Hmm, interesting. Europe is hard to read with the shades of blue. Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Quite a mixed bag there, Europe. Yep. What else do you see? So in terms of pure data visualization, okay, talking about data viz only, not about the model, not about the data, okay, White is in the middle, happy is blue, sad is red. Exactly. Right. Thank you, Tank. Tank Thunderbird. All right. Is that your real name? Should I call you Tank? <laughs> okay. Africa, bad. Yeah, totally. Brilliant. So, so exactly. In, in terms of data visualizations, we in this culture, in our culture here in England today, we are looking at blue being happy, but we're used to the blues, having the blues. Blues are not necessarily happiness. And red is love. So why is red a bad color in this graphic? Red is also alert and danger, but it's green that's the opposite of that in our visual, right? The traffic light story. So using red and blue here to denote happiness and unhappiness is playing tricks already with our cognition. We had to think carefully, okay? 
missing data for China. What is the gray or is that light blue? Yeah, totally, absolutely. So, so the, the point I'm making here is that this graphic is difficult to understand. It's playing tricks with us because it's using a scale of color that we don't usually ascribe to happiness, unhappiness. It's showing stark contrasts between some areas of the world and others are really quite ambiguous. And so what is it actually, again, what is it actually telling us? Okay, so it's a little, it's a little difficult. It's, it's not a graphic that you say, yes, I get it immediately from the first time. Do different cultures respond to these colors differently? Yes, they do. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that is another important thing. But red, red is almost always a happy color in a lot of countries rather than a sad color. You have people in India who wear red to their weddings, etc. So, yeah, it, culture definitely plays tricks with how you perceive this. All right, so let's move on to the next graphic, also about happiness as it happens. Now, this is a similar data set. It's using Kalmar colors. The lowest scoring countries are depicted in a pastel green shade that is comfortable to look at. And now my cadence of my voice is not so much crisis as calm, because this is what you're looking at. You're looking at a really calm picture here. And you're seeing the word happiness in the top corner and smiley faces at the bottom. And once again, it takes you a few minutes to figure out that what you're looking at is not a happy picture at all. OK, what you're looking at is, again, obviously a world map, again, showing stark poverty. And what have they measured and what are they trying to tell us? So once again, this infographic is playing tricks with us because happiness and smiley faces and pastel colors but the story is just as stark and just as unhappy in a global view than the previous one. So again, the colors that they chose to use, the, the, the positioning of, of the words and the faces is all playing tricks with our perception, with our cognition of, of this graphic. So let's, we've considered data. Now let's consider the five qualities of great visualizations that were put forward by Alberto Cairo a few years ago. Alberto Cairo is one of the world's, thank you, Tank, um, is one of the world's completely top leaders in, 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 in data visualization. I mean, he gives talks at, at enormous Google conferences and things like that. He's also a friend of mine, so I have a bias. <laughs> but it's not just me that thinks Alberto's the super coolest guy you'll ever meet. It's actually, except apart from my husband, of course. Um, there are other people who agree with me on that one as well. Um, Alberto. Okay. <laughs> so now first... OK, so let's talk about the five great, the, the five qualities of a great visualization. The first, they have to be based on real and solid research. The data has to have provenance. You have to know what you're measuring and who you've measured and what you've measured. Second, the data visualization has to accurately represent that data to allow interpretation. You have to be able to understand it quickly and accurately. The pies from Alabama that I showed earlier, for example, completely flout these, the first two rules of this completely. Um, oops, I clicked on the wrong thing. Yeah, here we are. The third rule, which we saw in the pastel colored world map above, the graphic is beautiful. There's, there's, there's no denying. It's a, it's a beautiful depiction, calm and happiness. But, okay, there were buts. One and two weren't quite there yet with this. Now, there's a whole movement about data is beautiful, information is beautiful, you can really beautify your graphics in, in superb ways. And David McCandless is the pioneer in this. Information is Beautiful is a book he wrote many years ago, and he continues to go from strength to strength about it. He's my second favorite data viz guru, okay, um, after Alberto. Um, we'll see more about uh, David's work in, in a little while later. Um, so now if I move forward, the fourth and fifth are insightful and enlightening. The finally, data viz, therefore, has to be truthful, functional, beautiful, insightful and enlightening. So if we consider these five qualities of great visualizations, we see that even though Alberto does not explicitly talk about perception and cognition, all these guidelines are to do with using perception and cognition principles to help people better understand, better interpret what they're looking at. There's also the responsibility to be honest, handling data with integrity. 
telling the real story that the data is trying to tell us. And so therefore, it's our responsibility as people who work with data or enable people who work with data, every sort of data, to be, you know, be a big data or small data or whatever, to rel relay the information that the data provides clearly and accurately. Now, what you're looking at now is simply a Google search of chart types. I literally did Google search chart types and, and took a screenshot. There you see bars comparing, uh, comparing things, lines showing directions, pies showing segments, area charts. All of this is absolutely brilliant. If scaled correctly, providing real information. They're also slightly boring to look at, you know. So there are that you can use beauty, you can use imagination, you can use a bit of creativity to, to make your charts more interesting. I'll show some examples. This is a graph which simply maps how much chocolate a country consumes against the number of Nobel laureates in that country. <laughs> Look carefully. Okay, see Switzerland. United Kingdom isn't doing too badly happily. All right. So this chart is actually used to teach people the difference between a random correlation, which this is. There's no correlation really and truly between how much chocolate people eat and, and, and whether they win Nobel Prizes or not. Um, um, so it's, it's, it's used to teach people the difference between a random correlation and causative association. There's no cause and effect relationship here between countries eating chocolate and whether they win the Nobel Prize or, or not. In terms of data viz, it's beautiful. It's clear. In terms of interpret interpreting, uh, interpreting this, if you don't think critically, you can come up to a causative answer, which is not correct. It's a simple, pure, happy, fun correlation that means nothing really and truly. OK, now in terms of data viz also, they used flags to denote the countries and they labeled them as well. So that's clear. It's beautiful. It's clear. It's insightful. Maybe not so enlightening because it doesn't really tell you anything, but it's it's fun. And maybe that is also something we need to, to think about when we look at these kinds of fun types of uh, of data. Now, I'm a big fan of Max Rosa. Max Rosa is um, yes, I'll come I'll come to books. Definitely. Um, I'm a big fan of Max Rosa. Our world in data, just Google our world in data and go and just browse. It's beautiful, fascinating, really, really cool. Um, he likes to take the glass half full view of life and his infographics are incredible at that. Um, they're beautiful to perceive and they're they're informative, they're, they're everything they should be. Um, this is an infographic about plastic pollution, a bar graph with benefits, in other words, okay? The more you look, the more you see in this graph. You could stare at it for quite a while. Um, here's another. Um, this is from Canada, I believe. In this data viz, they have tried to be clever using garbage bags to kind of show how much of each type of garbage that we collect. But just like with the pies from Alabama, although it's fun to use the garbage bags, there's not enough difference in the data to really jump out at you. So you're seeing greens and blues, but it's it's not it's not it's it's very cool. It's very it's fun. But maybe if they'd been bigger, maybe if the colors had been different, maybe if they'd actually put some organic material in the green to give you a more snap perception, cognition, understanding of exactly what you're looking at, it might have been better. Now, this might have started life as an area chart or a bar chart, maybe. It's a cool visualization showing the relative bandwidth usage of each of our senses takes to process the information that's provided to it. And you can see that sight uses a lot of brain power to actually cognitively understand what you're looking at. So it's a really powerful tool. It's a, it's a heavy tool, but it's a very powerful tool at the same time. And it's a really cool graphic. Very, very interesting. Clear, clean easy to see. This is another David McCandless taken from Information is Beautiful website. It shows how the media has managed to completely inflate. Oops, no, sorry, that's the wrong. That's the next one. <laughs> um, here he uses uh, text, what is consciousness? And he uses an artistic tendency to actually explain what different philosophers have talked about when they talk about consciousness. And I've often thought that this would make an excellent graphic if we wanted to actually use MRI images to talk about, let's say, sleep patterns or, 
or other types of health related issues dealing with with the brain. I, I, I love this for the potential it brings and the ideas it gives to other data viz um, um, topics. Um, this is the um, David McCandless that, that's on his website. It shows how the media has managed to completely inflate some topics um, and not highlight others. This one actually is interactive. Um, I, I'm not that familiar with Edward, Edward Tuff, John. I'll come back to that. Um, and, and so this one is an interactive data viz whereby you can actually click on each of these and get more information about it. Um, I'm going to pause for a second because there's a very interesting um, uh, question from Paula. One saw a data viz demonstrating the MS Power when it first launched, showing sales figures as fish in an aquarium. The bigger the fish, the bigger the number. No meaningful data, but the visual stuck in my mind. That's it. A picture speaks. But why did they use fish? I might not have used fish on that one, but OK, that's interesting. Anyway, it's stuck. And that, I guess, is the important bit. In this one here that we're looking at now, what sticks is the height of some of these. We don't see the little ones, even though they're probably just as important and probably affected just as many people, if not more people, than the ones showing the high bars. So Ebola, for example, was disastrous in a particular part of the world. The one I actually clicked on at random, as it happens, happened to be a vaccine story, okay? An anti-vax. Now, this is potentially affecting a lot more people than, than Ebola in terms of life and death. Huge numbers affected. But the media doesn't really hype it in the right way. So again, here you've got a data viz explaining communication. And that is where I want to just stop for another second. In the end, that is what data visualization really is. It's a communication tool. A data visualization is talking to you about that data. It's telling you a message. Whether we are inflating our company's sales or describing global happiness or talking about the effect of the media on our perception and cognition of everyday things, we are communicating a message. And it is our responsibility as enablers and producers of data viz to make sure that that message is accurate and easy to understand. Now, um, I'm looking at the time and I've spoken a lot, um, but these are the websites that I was going to take you to. I don't think I will because I'd like to have some interaction and questions and answers. Um, but this is Andy Kirk. He has a ton of material on his website, um, a lot of training uh, resources that you can attend. Um, some are paid, some are free. Um, he's based somewhere in England. I can't remember exactly where, um, Northumbria or Cumbria, somewhere quite quite far north but he's he's brilliant and he's my third favorite guru uh, for data viz david mccandless information is beautiful i completely urge you and and invite you to go there and and look around and explore the incredible visualizations that he shows um and he's a he's a he's a great guy too and my second favorite alberto is a friend of mine so he's gonna have to be my my first favorite um but alberto's um, Alberto's book, How Charts Lie, is a huge revelation, actually, in exactly how people use bad data viz or bad habits in data viz to completely distort um, information um, and, and cause misinformation, misleading information and all the rest of it. So if you don't if you look at information is beautiful and 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 admire, you come to Alberto and it. It, he makes you think. He makes you think very hard about what actually is data viz and how to interpret it. Um, again, each of these websites has training material in them, invitations to attend their webinars and all that. So please, again, go and, and explore and enjoy what they have to offer. Um, I'd like to point you to these two books. These bring data visualization to you at home with your paper and pencil. You don't need any technology at all to draw incredible, fun data viz about your life, about what you observe around you. Um, and these two books are a fantastic opening into that um, accessibility of data viz, really, that we can all be experts at data viz. We can all create beautiful data viz just with a bit of imagination and a bit of data. Um, and I'll just 
start the wrapping up here. Hopefully you've, um, in the last 40 minutes or so, understood what DataViz is, how tricky it is to interpret it at face value, how you have to think a little bit longer about it, um, and, and what data was behind it, and what the person telling you what their agenda is, and 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 what how they might have created the data vis to color your view about what you're looking at, and hopefully how to produce better and more interesting data visualizations as well. Now, this isn't strictly a data visualization, okay? It's a carpet woven by an Azerbaijani artist according to traditional carpet weaving techniques. It's a piece of art, okay? But even this, to me, is data because he speaks volumes about what is happening to his culture that dissolving of traditional values and so on and so forth. So imagine if you were using this, it, it's a little bit Salvador Dali-esque. Remember Salvador Dali's melting clocks? This is kind of in that realm, right? But using carpet weaving, traditional carpet weaving techniques. And, and I love that type of mix up because it's telling us that we can use all sorts of imagination, all sorts of inspiration to produce data visualizations that are beautiful, enlightening, truthful, and all the rest of those five values that we talked about earlier. And this brings me to a philosophical point that I'll leave you with. Is data visualization an art or a science or both? Of course, it's both. But let's think about that and actually try to implement it to make communication a bit more fun, a bit more interesting, a bit more real for people. So thank you. I'm completely humbled and stunned that there's 39 of you who stayed till at this moment. Um, again, I'm Sao San Kuri and uh, let's have your questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, is there any slide you'd like me to go back to? Any questions? I'm going to go into the chat now and, and go back a little. Um, and uh, thank you. Um, let me let me let me stay. Why don't I stay with uh, this one here? So if you haven't written them down, you can. Um, but if you if you'd like any other, let me know. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Tang. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. <laughs> you don't regret making time for this then. Thank you, Simon. Cheers, Peter. Thank you, everybody. No questions? I'd love to answer your questions. Ask me a question, someone. We've got five minutes. Thank you, Penny. My pleasure. Tuft, I'll look him up. I'm, I'm not familiar with his work, John. I'm sorry. My failing. I'll, I've made a note and I'll look him up. <laughs> Did you say it was Edward Tuft, didn't you? Edward Tuft. Yeah, I'll look him up. Thank you. Any more questions? Was there a question earlier that I didn't answer? Do different cultures respond to colors differently? Yes, we did answer that one. And you do have to be very culturally aware about the shapes that you use. I have um, a friend who wanted to uh, talk about um, footsteps, the, the footprint, the ecological footprint. Um, and her bar chart, she thought it was fantastic because her bar charts were feet. Now in this culture here, that's brilliant. But she was giving this into a very global audience. And I'm from the Middle East, I'm Lebanese. And in Lebanon, if you look at feet staring at us on a graph, that's insulting. <laughs> so, so we talked about that and I helped her develop a different visual for, for what she did in the end. So feet did not work for, for everybody there. And so yes, not just colors, but the images that you use are very, very culturally sensitive. You do have to think about that. Um, any more questions? Do you use Power BI or Tableau? Um, I, 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 I don't anymore. I used to. And when I did, it was Tableau. It was Tableau. But mostly because I worked with Alberto Caro and Alberto Caro uses Tableau. <laughs> Not because of anything other than, than, than that. I'm sure they're both fantastic. Power BI tends to be, as, it, as, it, as the name suggests, business intelligence. So they have a lot of tools for kind of more, more business-oriented graphics, whereas Tableau is a little bit more flexible and you can do a little bit more with it. Um, at least that's my perception, and I may be wrong on that. Do you think the current GIFs that the government is using regarding COVID are honest, misleading, or effective? <laughs> 
Um, I don't think they're very good, but I don't know if they're not honest. I I don't know if they're misleading. I don't I don't think they're misleading. I just don't think they're clear enough. Um, and I don't think they're focusing on the importance of, of things. They're giving people too much option. You know, you can wear a mask if you want to and you don't have to. Well, yeah, please wear a mask, everyone, okay? <laughs> um, so, I, I'm yeah, I don't think it's the data viz. I think it's the messaging uh, with, with current COVID-related things, um, if that makes any sense. Uh, would should be both an art and a science, but too many get lost in the science. Is that because teaching in unis, do you think... Yeah, possibly. Again, um, at the University of Miami, where I was introduced to DataViz by Alberto, um, I worked at the University of Miami for about 13 years uh, before moving back to England. Um, there, uh, DataViz was handled by the communications, by the School of Communications. And so it was part art and part science. It was its own separate thing. Um, and through an initiative that I led actually there, um, we, we, we really made, a, we, we broke an enormous number of silos and brought a lot of scientists into that realm of, of art, communication, descriptive uh, type of explaining the science. Um, and I think, I still think they're doing it brilliantly over there. I do see some other examples in this country, but I'm not particularly familiar with, with, with all of them yet. Um, I, I do think that science communication should be taught across the board in every university, core modules. Every, every single scientist should have a core module on science communication. That I definitely believe. And that that science communication module should have a data viz bit inside it. Um, I, 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 yeah, Paula, that's, that's, that's my not on the fence bit about that one. <laughs> um, what are my thoughts uh, on data viz in VR? Very interesting. Lots of scope. Wow. Yes. I mean, if we're still, if we are able to confuse in 2D and 3D, imagine what it would be like when we have sound and smell as well. Lots of, yeah, lots of scope, lots of scope. I can't wait to see what comes out. Um, I'm hoping to be on the enabling bit about that, not the production end anymore. Beautiful, yes, good question. Most of my education and visualization was in my CSE in graphic communications at uni. It was all about using software tools, yeah. Boring software tools as well, I bet, unless you are doing graphic design, um, and then and then you you know you you might be using Adobe Illustrate or something else to to really create some imaginative, creative, fun graphics. Have a look at David McCandless. See if you can attend a couple of his webinars. You might you you might enjoy that, Tom. Business IT, yeah. <laughs> 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 Try Tableau. <laughs> More creative scope, scope a little. <laughs> yeah, use your imagination. Just fly, do it. Any other questions? Anyone else? We're a pro oh my gosh, we're over time. I think I think I'm done. It was forty five minutes. I love the fact that you're all still here. Thirty five of you. I'm so humbled. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a feeling I should be releasing you, but I don't know. Nobody's telling me what to do. <laughs> ah, there's Hi. <laughs> Great. Hi, Becky. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, we've got kind of 10 minutes or so until the next thing starts on the main stage. Um, so if there are any okay. final questions, um, that's absolutely fine. Um, otherwise, people can uh, kind of head back to the main stage and um, the next thing will kick off at half 11. Brilliant. I'm happy to stay here for 10 minutes for answering discussion. Um, oops. Uh, Becky, you need to mute. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> You're welcome, John. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Tank. Betty, can you mute? Becky, can you mute, please? What is that? Oh, that's what this is. <laughs> okay, stop. It's not you. Sorry, Becky, that was me.
I clicked on Tank's video. Oh, okay. And, and it was playing loud. I'm sorry, that was me. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, really I interesting I talk. Play directly. I was just I was parking it in a in a tab. Oh, know? okay. Don't worry. Yes. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> um, Tom's just asking a final question. There, um, is bad yeah. visualization techniques more prone to showing to deliberately? Showing deliberately misleading data. Um. It takes a it takes a good liar to lie well. Okay, I'll just leave that there. Um, I don't think it's bad visualization techniques. I think they are they're using optical illusion. They're using what could be good visualization techniques to mislead people. So bad data viz is bad data viz. Badly done, like those spies. You know, not appropriate to the data set. Not informative. Visualizations that deliberately mislead are a little bit more cunning than that and they they might not be bad visuals they might be good visuals that's why they're misleading we believe them so yeah i think it's back to honesty and integrity on that it's back to truthful thank you thank you paula my pleasure thanks sandra yeah i will <laughs> you too <laughs> keep smiling you're welcome tom good thoughtful questions i'm happy to stay for another five ten minutes Thanks, John. Thanks, Jim. How did I get started? Um, I got started, I guess, um, very early on um, when I was doing my PhD and um, I wanted some a different way of showing what was happening in my data. Um, and I used test tubes, real test tubes, larger and smaller test tubes to do a bar chart and my supervisor at the time told me that wasn't scientific and it wouldn't fly and I got annoyed. <laughs> so that's how I started. <laughs> but um, but uh, yeah, a salient moment that tipped me over the edge was I was working at the University of Miami and I was director of engagement for computational science across the whole university. And I needed something that I needed a, a topic that was going to be something that everybody used that I could engage everybody with so that whether you're in the school of law or the school of communication or the school of business or the medical school or marine science or physics or engineering, I needed one topic that could bring everybody together. Because I was in computational science, that topic was perceived to be data analysis. But I needed something a bit more cool. And I came across data visualization it, it kind of I I was reading the I wasn't reading the newspaper I was reading a blog something you know it was one of those moments where wow well that's it data viz I'm gonna do data viz who in Miami does data viz and I found Alberto we applied for some money from the dean we got a whole group together we did something very cool and, in, and did in fact in the end engage the whole university, except the School of Law, who was more interested in robotics at the time. But I believe they're now, I, I, I left about four years ago, but I believe they are engaged in data viz there too, even the School of Law. And we, we uh, my team, we, we were, I pride, I'm very proud of this. We were the first computational science team to have an English PhD student who was working on text analysis of in, some kind of ancient English um, to, to actually learn uh, about cool data viz. And he was using words in his bar graphs and, and scatter plots. And it was just beautiful what he was producing but he was a PhD student in English so I told him my story about my my test tubes and how my PhD supervisor would not let me use that in my PhD thesis and we had a good laugh and it was nice to kind of tie that back in <laughs> that's my salient moment thank you Matthew <laughs> any other questions anyone there we still have 23 people here I'm well, guessing that you're going to be. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> I'm thrilled. I'm humbled. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. So we allow everyone to go network then, Becky? I think so, yeah. Okay, brilliant. All right. Thanks very much, Becky, for your help. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for a great talk, Sasan.
My pleasure. I'm delighted. It was fun. All right. <laughs> Bye then. Bye. Bye. You're welcome, Matthew. Thank you, everyone.